بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعن جابر بن سمرة رضي الله عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان في الخطبة يقرأ آيات من القرآن يذكر الناس رواه أبو داود وأصله في مسلم so our next hadith, and we only have a handful of ahadith left to complete uh, the chapter of Jumu'ah, is the hadith of Jabir ibn Samurah radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the khutbah used to recite certain ayat from the Qur'an. And he would remind the people. He would deliver a reminder to the people. And this is narrated by Abu Dawood. And the original hadith is in Sahih Muslim. This hadith is a part of a hadith which talks about the, the parts, the necessary parts of the khutbah. But the focus of the wording here is that the Prophet ﷺ used to recite ayat from the Qur'an during his khutbah. And from this you can kind of understand as we learned that he uh, in the hadith uh, of the female companion who said ما حفظت قاف والقرآن المجيد إلا عن لسان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقرأها كل جمعة على المنبر. That I only memorized قاف والقرآن المجيد from the tongue of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم يعني from the mouth of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when he was on the minbar on the day of Jumu'ah. And from this we can understand that the, the khutbah of the Prophet وسلم, was centered around the Qur'an, around reciting ayat from the Qur'an, and that they formed, if you like, the sort of the, 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 the key points or the topics of the khutbah were built around the ayat of the Qur'an. So this hadith indicates the permissibility of reciting something from the Qur'an during the khutbah and that the imam is free to choose whichever ayat he feels are appropriate or whichever ayah he feels is appropriate to this particular uh, situation. But he has to choose an ayah which matches with the topic of the khutbah. It's not the case that he recites a random ayah and then he speaks on a different topic. Rather the ayah, the topic, they should be matching uh, one another. This hadith also contains that the khutbah should be a reminder and it should contain a admonition and a sort of, if you like, an inspiration to the people who listen to it. And we've covered this already uh, before. Allah Azza wa Jal told us in the Qur'an in, uh, in uh, Surah Al-Dhariyat, فَذَكِّرْ uh, Sorry, in Surah Qaf, فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيد Remind with the Qur'an the one who fears the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, and Allah Azza wa Jal told us in Surah Al-Dhariyat, فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The reminder benefits the believers. So the khutbah should have as a part of it recitation of the ayat of the Qur'an and those should be around and linked with the topic and likewise it should also have reminders and admonition and remembrance and you know something to teach people and remind them of their duties 
to Allah Azza wa Jal and remind them of the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal, as Allah Azza wa Jal told us in this particular ayah, فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيدٌ The one who fears the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the Shaykh, he mentions in his explanation, Shaykh Saleh Ozan, Hafizahullah ta'ala, he mentions in his explanation a very important point about reciting ayat in the khutbah. The, the ayat, some of them can be recited on their own and some of them, they have to be recited in context. And that is if you were to take an ayah or a part of an ayah and recite it and the context was to give a different meaning or was to confuse the people, then you're not allowed to recite this ayah on its own. You have to recite it with its context. For example, if I were to say, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Woe to the people who pray. Woe to the people who pray. This would be a something wrong. We cannot uh, make a statement like this. Because people would understand from this that it's not a good thing to pray or that the one who prays is doing something wrong. But when you recite it in context, فَوَيْنُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Those who neglect their prayers, those who are forgetful about their prayers, those who pray without concentration, then it makes sense. So when you recite ayat or parts of ayat, it's very important that you recite enough of the Qur'an that people understand the context of what is being said. So the Shaykh, he said, for example, if the Imam were to recite, ثُمَّ نَظَرْ Then he looked. You don't understand the context because you, without the previous ayat, you can't understand what is meant by ثُمَّ نَظَرْ Because it doesn't give you enough information. So it's important when the Imam chooses the ayat, that he chooses ayat which are... Uh, which give a complete message to the people and that he doesn't choose a piece of an ayah that leads to confusion or leads to somebody uh, you know maybe uh, getting the wrong uh, message we move on to our next hadith وَعَنْ طَارِقُ بْنِ شِهَابٍ أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالَ الْجُمُعَةُ حَقٌ وَاجِبٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ على كل مسلم في جماعة إلا أربعة مملوك وامرأة وصبي ومريض رواه أبو داود وقال لم يسمع طارق من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأخرجه الحاكم من رواية طارق المذكورة عن أبي موسى From طارق بن شهاب the messenger, the, the, the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said جمعة is haqqun wajib it is a a right that is it's something which you which is you're obliged to do and it's wajib it's an obligation upon every muslim every muslim who is fi jama'ah who is among a group except for four the slave and a woman and a child and a sick person. This hadith was narrated by Abu Dawood and Abu Dawood said, Tariq did not hear from the Prophet So this chain, particular chain here of Tariq from the Prophet it has a gap in it because Tariq did not hear this hadith from the Prophet However, Al-Hakim in another narration he brings it from Tariq from Abu Musa from Abi Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu an from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa indicating that the person that Tariq heard it from was Abu Musa and Abu Musa heard it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa however this also has a weakness in the chain what we can say though is that this hadith when we put all of its chains together it seems to be a fair hadith it seems to be a fair hadith when you put together all of the different chains and you gather them together, it seems to be that the hadith is fair and it's certainly a hadith which contains a lot of evidence with regard to the Jumu'ah. So the first thing that it establishes that Jumu'ah is Fardu'ayn. 
it's not fardu kifaya. It's not a collective obligation. Some people might think about Jum'ah. It's a collective obligation. As long as there are people in the masjid, that's okay. But that's not the case. Jum'ah is haqqun wajibun ala kulli muslim. It is a right upon and it is a obligation, an obligation for every single Muslim. The first thing is that Muslim should be in a jama'ah. Who does this exclude? This excludes the Muslim who is by himself in the desert. And this person is not in a jama'ah, so they don't have to pray Jum'ah. And it excludes the people that he comes and there's only him and the Imam. And so on, and he, or there's only him on his own. So we said that the, the, the lowest number that you need for Jumu'ah is the Imam and two people in the congregation. And it includes the Bedouins who move around from place to place. And they don't have a, you know, a place of dwelling or a place of residence and they just, you know, they, they go around from place to place. There are four people though who are resident in the city or four people, in, four people from those who are in a jama'ah. They're in a group. But these four people in the group, they don't have to pray Jumu'ah. However, what we will say is that Jumu'ah is accepted from all of them. That means that if they come to Jumu'ah, their Jumu'ah is accepted. However, they're not obliged to come to Jumu'ah. The first one is Al Mamluk, the slave. And the slave obviously is owned by someone, and they have a right to that slave's time. Now, already the slave goes to pray five times a day because we know slaves are not exempt from, from praying. But if the slave were to go to the Jumu'ah and has to go to the Jumu'ah, and you know the time involved in that, then that would take and that would be hard upon the slave and hard upon the owner. Hard upon the owner because the owner is going to lose one hour of the slave's time to the Jumu'ah prayer. And it would be hard upon the slave since the owner may ask the slave to make up the time and it becomes hard upon them to ask them to do their duties and also that they have to come to the Jumu'ah. So the slave is exempt from the Jumu'ah. If they come and pray, it's perfectly fine. If their owner gives them permission to pray and they pray, it is fine. But they do not have to attend the Jumu'ah. If they don't attend the Jumu'ah, they have to pray Dhuhr. The second one is the lady, the woman. And that is because for a woman to pray in her home is better. As the Prophet ﷺ said, وَبُيُوتُهُنَّ خَيْرٌ لَهُنْ Their homes are better for them. So it would be better for her to pray in her home. And if she wants to come to the Jumu'ah and she attends, there is no harm in that. And there is a benefit in that for her, inshaAllah ta'ala. And it's accepted, but it's not wajib upon her. Also think about the organization. If all the men went out for Jumu'ah and you have small babies in the home, who is going to take care of them? The men have to go. So if the lady doesn't have any obligations and she wants to go, she can go. But if she has other things to do, we're not going to make a hardship for her that she has to bring out her little baby who is like one year old and she has to bring him to the khutbah because she has to go and her husband has to go. Instead, if she wants to stay at home, she can stay at home. But if she stays at home, she has to pray dhuhr. And the third is the sabi, the young person, the young child who hasn't yet reached puberty. None of the prayers are obligatory upon the young child who hasn't reached puberty. However, if they pray them, those prayers are accepted from them and they are voluntary prayers in their, in their regard. However, the Prophet ﷺ told us, command your children to pray, or he told, command your children to pray from seven and discipline them from ten. So from seven years old, Hijri, you have to command your children, and that means the boys, you have to tell them, come to Jumu'ah, come to Jumu'ah. And if they say no, you don't beat them or shout at them or whatever. Then when they get to 10 years old Hijri, you say to them, come to Jumu'ah. And if they don't come to Jumu'ah, you discipline them. And you take a punishment against them. If by 10 years old, the boy is not coming with you to Jumu'ah. However, it's not an obligation upon them. They're not sinful if they miss the Jumu'ah. And if they miss the Jumu'ah and they wish to pray or they're going to pray something, they should pray Dhuhr instead. But of course, 
uh, they may, if they're seven years old, they may just say, I don't want to pray anything, I'm tired, I'm sick, I don't want to. And at seven years old, you don't, you don't force them, but you ask them to. And finally, the sick person. And likewise, this is an ease for the sick person and an ease for the congregation. So that the sickness doesn't spread among the people who are coming for the Jumu'ah. So the sick person is not obliged to come for, for the Jumu'ah, but they have to pray dhuhr instead. However, sickness is of different levels. So we're not going to say that the person who has a small cold is not going to come to the Jumu'ah. But the person who is really sick and there is a hardship for them to come to the Jumu'ah, or there is a danger for them to come to the Jumu'ah, then this person is exempt from the Jumu'ah. As for everyone else, everyone else, it is wajib upon them. What about a case of emergencies, as we say in the Sharia, in the rules of the Sharia, the principles of the Sharia, that emergencies have their own rulings. So emergencies are not mentioned in a hadith because they have their own separate rulings. Al-Darura has its own separate ruling. So someone is in an emergency, that's a different situation. But these four people, as a habit, you know, on a week-by-week -week basis, it's not obligatory for them to come to the Jumu'ah, and that is the slave and the woman, and the young boy and the sick person, or the young child and the sick person. There is a fifth which is narrated in a hadith from Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma wa an Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma annahu qal qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam laysa ala musafirin jumu'a rawahu al-tabarani bi isnad dha'if This is a hadith of Ibn Umar that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there is no jumu'a for the traveler and this is narrated by al-tabarani with a weak chain of narration However, the concept, the principle of it is valid. That the, the, the musafir is the fifth person out of that, those category that is not obliged to pray the Jumu'ah. What kind of safar? The kind of safar that you shorten your prayer for. So if you are shortening your prayer and you are praying dhuhr as two raka'at, you're not obliged to pray the Jumu'ah. However, you may pray if you wish. Now someone may say, what is your evidence if this hadith in a tabarani is weak? Our evidence is that the Prophet ﷺ did not pray Jumu'ah in all of his travels. There are times he prayed, there are times that he didn't. So this is an evidence for us that Jumu'ah is not an obligation for the traveler. But if the traveler prays it, they, can, they, they, are, they are welcome to pray it. And if they pray dhuhr instead, that is fine. However, there is one principle that we have to appreciate from this. If the musafir, the traveler, prays Jumu'ah, they are not allowed to combine it with Asr. It is not acceptable, nor is the Salah valid to combine Jumu'ah and Asr. Dhuhr and Asr is what we have an evidence for combining. We have an evidence to combine Dhuhr and Asr. And we already said Jumu'ah and Dhuhr are two different things. Yes, if you pray Jumu'ah, you don't need to pray Dhuhr. But they are two different things. They are not interchangeable, one for one. And so it's not allowed for you to combine Jumu'ah and Asr. If you are a Musafir, you, have to, you pray Jumu'ah. Then at Asr time, you pray two, two raka'at for Asr. But you can't pray after Jumu'ah two raka'at for Asr. Your Jumu'ah is your Jumu'ah and your Asr has to be at Asr time because it is not, you haven't prayed Dhuhr. You can combine Dhuhr and Asr because we have an evidence for that. But we don't have an evidence for combining Jumu'ah and Asr. We only have an evidence for combining Dhuhr and Asr. And likewise, Jumu'ah is the prayer of the resident, not the prayer of the traveler. And so the, the resident isn't a person who combines with Asr. So that's another reason why we don't combine Jumu'ah and Asr. Instead, we pray Jumu'ah. If we're traveling, we want to pray Jumu'ah, we can pray it. But we pray Asr 
at Asr time separately. And there's no harm in shortening it, uh, in shortening it still. وعن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه أنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا استوى على المنبر استقبلناه بوجوهنا رواه الترمذي بإسناد ضعيف وله شاهد من حديث براء عند ابن خزيمة From Abdullah ibn Mas'ud say He said that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم when he would climb upon the mimbar, we would face him, we would turn our faces towards him, or we would face him, our faces towards him. And this is narrated by a Tirmidhi with a weak chain of narration, but it has a supporting evidence in the hadith of Al-Bara, which is narrated by Ibn Khuzaymah. Uh, the muhaqqiq here said, we didn't find this hadith with Ibn Khuzayma, but it is narrated by Al-Bayhaqi. So it may be that it was narrated by Ibn Khuzayma and, and uh, it has been missed from the copy of Ibn Khuzayma that we have now, but it was present in the time of Al-Hafid ibn Hajar. And it may be that Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, when he wrote Ibn Khuzayma, he intended to write Al-Bayhaqi. In any case, the hadith is present in Al-Bayhaqi with, from the hadith of Al-Bara. And this indicates to us a principle that it is the sunnah is for the imam to turn his back to the qibla when giving the khutbah. Because a person may think that this is a part, you know, you have the prayer, you face the qibla. What about the khatib facing the qibla and the other people turning around or something like that? No, the sunnah is that the, the, the Prophet would climb the mimbar, turn his back to the qibla, and he would teach and the, he would deliver the sermon. And then the people would turn towards him and they would look at him uh, and they would turn their faces towards him. So this is the etiquette uh, in relation to that. And of course this is most important uh, for people to understand what it is that the khatib is saying. And likewise, it is also important so that they can fully comprehend what the khatib is saying, that they, they are looking at the khatib. And if they look down on the floor, there is no harm in that, but they are facing the khatib. If they didn't understand what he said, they can look up at him. But they have that, you know, they are looking and they are concentrating on what it is that the khatib uh, is saying. It's not necessary that they should look at the khatib uh, directly. But at least they, they should be facing the, 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 the direction of the Qibla and the Khatib should be facing the opposite direction from the Qibla. And what is, I believe, the last hadith in Babu Salat al Jumu'ah? وعن الحكم ابن حزن رضي الله عنه أنه قال شهدنا الجمعة مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقام متوكئا على عصا أو قوس رواه أبو داود from الحاكم from الحكم ابن حزن that he said we witnessed the Jumu'ah with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he stood resting upon a stick or a spear and it was narrated by Abu Dawood from this is that from the etiquettes of the Imam on the day of Jumu'ah is for the Imam to have something to rest against and to support himself against it does not have to be a stick it does not have to be a spear it doesn't have to be a you know um, uh, a, for example a walking stick it can be the wooden edge of the mimbar, it can be the side of the mimbar, it can be the side of the chair, the back of the chair, but he has something. And some of the scholars said that what this does, it delivers strength in his, you know, like he's standing there and he's resting himself, he's comfortable, and it, it allows him to give a very powerful uh, delivery. If he doesn't do that, then there is no harm in that. Another reason that the scholars mention for this is it stops him from fiddling. It stops the khatib from, you know, like maybe 
fidgeting and fiddling and rocking from one foot to the other foot and this will cause the people in the khutbah also to fidget and to rock around and you know if the khatib is restless so it allows the khatib to be firm and strong and to deliver a really strong khutbah and likewise uh, it benefits the people in that regard uh, but if the khatib doesn't do it it's not an obligation for the khatib to do it however it is a sunnah for the khatib to rest himself on something to rest his hands or one of his hands on something presumably one of his hands because if the prophet sallallahu had a stick or an, or a spear he would have one hand on it not two but there is no harm if he puts two hands on the wooden frame of the mimbar or one hand or he puts one hand on the side of a chair or something like that to give him stability to stop him moving around and to be able to you know really deliver his khutbah with the most sort of uh, with a very clear and in a very clear and very powerful way that really strikes the hearts of the people and we've spoken about this in the beginning so this concludes for us babu salat al jumu'ah the jumu'ah prayer of course like in any uh, book there will be a number of issues that were not included here the book does not include every single issue remember that al hafiz ibn hajar rahimahullah ta'ala here is a little bit limited because he's not mentioning anything from his own speech very little except just a comment at the end the week a weak chain or an authentic chain he's he's mentioning only a hadith so he's not going to mention sort of ayat he's not going to mention consensus he's not going to mention this scholar said this and that scholar said this he's just going to mention the the hadith so there are going to be some issues that are missing but we've got a good idea now about the jumu'ah and we have covered many of the masail fiqhia many of the fiqh issues relating to the jumu'ah i just want to introduce the next topic which is babu salat al khawf the chapter of the fear prayer now i'm not going to go into it too much i'm not going to read any hadith inshallah ta'ala but i do want to introduce it because it is something that we are not used to in fact i can pretty much say there's probably nobody in this masjid who has ever prayed salat al khawf and that's uh any a rarity any like if it, we said the eclipse prayer yes people have prayed the eclipse prayer if we said had you know people who's prayed tahajjud there are people who has prayed duha there are people who prays two rak'at after they make wudu there are people but salatul khawf maybe there is nobody maybe there is maybe there is nobody in the masjid who has ever prayed salatul khawf so it is something which is important to learn but which will not be familiar to you at all salatul khawf is called salatul khawf meaning that al khawf is the cause for it al khawf means fear so fear is the cause for you to pray like that that's why it's called salatul khawf the pre, the fear prayer it's not because you pray like it's something about the way you, or the or the, the you're praying because you're feeling some fear or i'm feeling scared let me pray it's that the fear is the reason for you to pray like that you're going to change the way you pray because of fear of an enemy because of fear uh, of an enemy and fear here it 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 doesn't just mean fear any fear like oh i'm scared of this i'm scared of what's behind the door or something like that it is al khawf which is dhidd al amn which is the you know like when you're living in security and safety and peace the opposite of that you know when you're when you're in a dangerous situation it could be known as that you know the prayer of of fear and danger or something like that when you're in a dangerous situation when there's no safety there's no security when you fear for your life you know that is the kind of this is the the prayer that we are talking about and the first thing that we learn is the very fact that there is a fear prayer benefits us in two ways the first thing it benefits us is the principle that prayer is never ever left somebody shooting bullets at you you pray somebody is waving a sword over your head you pray somebody is chasing you down the road with a big knife you pray 
there is never a time when a Muslim doesn't pray. But that prayer will be changed and adapted in many different ways according to the situation. So the way you pray when there's an enemy in front of you pointing a gun but he's not firing is different from the way you pray when he's firing at you. And the way you pray when someone's chasing you down the street is different from the way you pray when the, the armies are lined up in two rows and they're facing each other and deciding when they're going to fight. So each level of that fear for your life has a different way of, uh, of praying. But the prayer is there. If it's the prayer time, you pray. You pray. And this is really important. And the second thing is, Salatul Khawf is prayed in the jama'ah, except in the worst amount of fear, except in the moment when it's like absolute fear for your life and you're running away from an enemy. In everything other than that, in every other situation, Salatul Khawf is prayed in the jama'ah. What does that tell you about the importance of the jama'ah? That the jama'ah is fard upon the men, as we said. Because if the jama'ah were not fard, why are we praying in jama'ah when there's an enemy trying to shoot us, when there's an enemy trying to cut us or stab us or do whatever to us, fight us? Why would we pray in jama'ah? Because of the obligation of the jama'ah. It's very important. And if the jama'ah isn't left when you are in a state of fearing for your life, then it shouldn't be left in a state where you're not fearing for your life. So this is uh, something important uh, to note. As for the proofs for Salatul Khawf, they are proven by the Quran and by the Sunnah and by consensus. As for the Quran, we have ayah number 102 in Surah An-Nisa and we have ayah number 238 and 239 in Surah Al-Baqarah. We're going to come to these anyway. We're most likely going to come to these anyway, so we don't need to go too much at the moment. But the ayah in Surah An-Nisa, وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ فَلْتَقُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ مِّنْهُمْ مَعَكْ وَلْيَأْخُذُوا أَسْلِحَتَهُمْ فَإِذَا سَجَدُوا فَلْيَكُونُوا مِنْ وَرَائِكُمْ وَلْتَأْتِي طَائِفَةٌ أُخْرَى لَمْ يُصَلُّوا فَلْيُصَلُّوا مَعَكْ الآيه Surah An-Nisa This refers to not the extreme fear of life but when, you know, it, it's something's about to start like the battle is about to start so at the moment nobody is actually swinging a sword at you or pointing or, or shooting at you but what's happening is the armies are in rows and they're ready to attack at any minute this is where Surah An-Nisa comes in and the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah حَافِذُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ فَرِجَالًا أَوْ رُكْبَانًا فَإِذَا أَمِنْتُمْ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَمَا عَلَّمَكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ Guard the prayers, especially the middle prayer, the Asr prayer, and stand to Allah in silence. And you stand to Allah without talking to each other. And if you fear, then while you are walking or while you are riding. I mean, while you are walking, while you're on foot or while you are riding. This refers to extreme fear. I and mean, someone is chasing you and while you're walking, you are praying. And while you're running away from them, you're praying. While you're riding away from them, you're riding away, they're chasing you, you're riding your horse, they're riding the horse. Or you're, they're chasing you in the one, they have their whatever tank or you know, vehicle, and you have your vehicle, and you're running away from them and they're chasing you, you still pray. But you pray in the situation you're in. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And then you make ruku as you are, and you just come up as you are driving, as you are running, as you are riding, as you are defending yourself with your sword, as you are lying on the floor in a ditch. You pray as you, as you are. This is an extreme fear when, you, when the moment is that you fear that if you used to stand up, you would lose your life. So these are the two situations. So we've learned that Salatul Khawf can be divided into two parts. It can be divided into extreme fear and we can say that less than extreme fear. Or imminent danger to your life versus perceived danger to your life. That's a good way of looking at it. Imminent danger to your life, meaning you stand up, you're dead. 
that has its Surah Al-Baqarah, you pray as you are, whichever way you are. And perceived threat to your life, you think that if you were to pray your normal prayer in the normal way, there's a danger that your enemy would attack you at that time. So there's a perceived threat and there's an imminent threat. The imminent threat, when you are, you know, at, you, literally the bullets are zooming past your, your ears. In this case, you pray wherever you are, however you are. But you just make your ruku' and your sujood, your ruku' a little bit lower, your sujood a little bit lower than your ruku'. As for when you are perceiving a threat, meaning that at the moment, nobody's shooting anybody, but they all got their guns out pointing and we've all got our guns out pointing and you know, if we go and pray, they're just gonna shoot us while we're praying. <laughs> this is where the ayah in Surah An-Nisa comes in. As for the sunnah, there are approximately five or six different ways of praying Salat al-Khawf. All of which are narrated in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as for the ijma' or consensus, then the scholars have unanimously agreed upon the, the permissibility of the fear prayer while fighting an enemy. However, one of the conditions that they put down for Salat al-Khawf is that the fighting that you are doing must be a permissible form of fighting. So, permissible, uh, the permissible uh, forms of, uh, of fighting, i.e. that is legitimate fighting that is sanctioned by the ruler and so on and so forth, and all of the conditions that fighting has that we will probably do if we reach to Kitab al-Jihad, uh, all of those things, they said that it has to be a permissible form of fighting. As for you fighting your, a gang, you, your gang is fighting the gang down the street and you both got weapons out and you both start praying Salat al-Khawf? No, because this is not a permissible form of fighting. This is just gang violence. Or you know, you are having a fight with a guy you had a disagreement with and while he's like sort of, you know, hovering around you with a knife and you're hovering around him and you say, okay, we're gonna pray Salat al-Khawf. It's not like that. You, you, Salat al-Khawf is there for permissible forms of fighting so that includes the, the fighting which is sanctioned against the non-muslims the fighting which is sanctioned against the muslims who rebel against their ruler and uh, the fighting against the criminals who uh, try to for example highway robbers and things like that because in those days remember they didn't have a police and an army Probably the two were very, you know, were very similar. If you had criminals who were, uh, who were killing people on the roads, they would send the army. They wouldn't send, you know, they didn't have like a, a policeman that they would send to deal with that. They would send the army. And I suppose even until now in certain extreme situations, it may be the case that the army gets drafted in for extreme uh, amounts of, of, you know, these uh, some criminals who have gone to an extreme uh, amount of violence. Even then they may well draft the army in but here it's he's saying that it is permissible if you are part of an army who is fighting a criminal group like your leader has told you this is a group of criminals they are you know they're pirates or they are killing people on the roads or highway robbers or whatever it is or they are kidnapping people and we want you as an army to go and fight them then when you go and fight them you can pray Salat al-Khawf that's one of the things that is permissible fighting and likewise, a person may say, well, can you pray Salat al-Khawf if you're fighting against another group of Muslims, if that other group of Muslims has transgressed against the rules? But for, uh, as Allah Azza so told us in Surah Al-Hujurat, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا فَإِنْ بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبَغِي حَتَّى تَفِيئَ إِلَى أَمْرِ الله. If two groups of the believers fight against one another, make peace between them. And if one of them transgresses against the other, then fight against the one that transgresses until they return to the command of Allah. So this is an example of a rebellious group, like a rebel group, who goes against the, the other Muslims, the ruler of the Muslims and the Muslim country, and they form a rebel group and they fight against the 
they fight against the Muslims. When you fight against them, you may pray Salatul Khawf. So three main groups that you can pray Salatul Khawf when you're fighting against them. The non-Muslims, which are legitimate, uh, the ruler has designated that there is a, a war against them. He's declared war. In these days, we would say has de we would say there is a declaration of war between you. Any your country and their country has made a declaration of war, and you have joined your the, that army, and your ruler has given you permission to fight against them. Then these are the non-Muslims that it is permissible to fight against, and the Muslims who have transgressed, like the rebe rebellious groups and the Khawarij, who have transgressed against their the authorities, and likewise the criminal elements where it is needed for an army to fight against them and maybe they are robbing people or kidnapping people or committing piracy then it is also permissible to pray the fear prayer in this uh, in this case al imam ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala said the fear prayer is authentically reported from the prophet sallallahu in five or six ways all of them are permissible, which means that the Imam is free to choose any of these five or six. And whoever does all of them, then that is something good. Some of the scholars took more than that and they said more than five or six. Some of them went to many, many tens and tens of different ways. But really what they have done, as some of the scholars said, they haven't really seen different ways what they've done is take different narrations and perspectives and they've taken different sahabas or sahabi explaining and they've taken different perspectives but when you boil it all down and you kind of organize it there are only five or six different ways of praying the fear prayer and we're going to basically when we talk about the fear prayer we're going to stop now but when we talk about the fear prayer next week inshallah we talk about the description basically you need to think about two things Severe fear or impending danger versus perceived danger, a lesser fear. The impending danger we know, you pray however you can, in the best way you can. Even if you're in the middle of a sword fight and you're clashing swords with the enemy and the only your time is about to go, you, what, what you can do, you do. You do the best that you can do. As for... Uh, the one where there is a perceived danger. So now, you know, the two armies are facing each other. The swords are raised. You know, you think hey, they're going to jump at any time. This is the one we're going to talk about. And this has two categories. Whether the enemy is facing the Qibla or whether the enemy is facing away from the Qibla. Why? When the enemy is in the direction of the Qibla, Meaning when the enemy, not when the enemy is facing, when you are facing the Qibla, your, when your enemy is in your Qibla direction, or when your, en when your enemy is away from your Qibla direction. When your enemy is away from your Qibla direction, it requires you to turn your back on your enemy to face the Qibla. This is more dangerous, which is why the fear prayer, when the enemy is not in line with the Qibla, is different from the fear prayer when the enemy is in line with the Qibla. When the enemy is in line with the Qibla, it's not so dangerous. Because whatever happens, yes, you have to watch the sujood, but ruku' and standing, it's all fine. Because you're still standing and you can still, if your enemy rushes towards you, you can still respond to it. But when you turn your back on your enemy, this is the danger. So where you would have to all turn around and all the soldiers just, you know, write the enemy sword to sword and all the soldiers just turn around, like stab me in the back. That's when it becomes more dangerous and that's where you have the more elaborate fear prayer where one row is you know, waiting and guarding and the other row is praying then the other row is waiting and guarding and the other row is praying and they are swapping over like that. When the enemy is in the direction of the Qibla all you are doing really is praying sujood at different times. That's all you're doing. You do rukur together, you stand together, you pray together, you, you, the imam stands at the front everything is fine, uh, you do the tashahud together, you do the taslim together, but you do the sajda in two groups. One group does the sajda and the other group stands, then when they stand up, the other group does the sajda and they stand. So it's like, a, uh, like swapping the sajda only. But 
the one where you turn your back, this is more complicated because this is more dangerous for the Muslims that the enemies could easily attack them when their backs are, when their backs are turned. The last thing I will mention is Sheikh Muthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala was asked, war today is so different from war in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is there really, and can, can we still, how do we still do the fear prayer? And can we still do the fear prayer? When, you know, now people fight in, you know, in tanks and, you know, armored vehicles and, you know, people fight in, in diff they don't fight in a line. Usually they fight in different formations and they move around and things like that. And they have rockets and they have, you know, mortars. and all. Things are very different from when you used to stand in a line with a sword and wait for them to jump on you. It's very, very different. Uh, so, Sheikh said, basically, he quoted the ayah, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah as much as you can. And he recommended that you come as close to the fear prayer of the Prophet ﷺ as possible when you need it. But that you may, you know, there may be, you may not be able to do the fear prayer completely as he did it if the situation in the war is different from the situation that they were, that they were in. But in general, the rules, you know, the rules still apply. And within these five, you can find a form that will work for pretty much any situation where two armies are fighting against each other. So inshallah ta'ala, we will cover the description of the five or six different ways. We will cover the ahadith, uh, which are used as evidence for them. And we will do that next week, bi idhnillahi ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.